On average, it takes 9 to 15 years of untreated illness to be diagnosed with and treated for a primary immunodeficiency. Recent studies estimate that 70 to 90% of those with PI do not yet have a diagnosis. You're listening to Undiagnosed, an Immune Deficiency Foundation podcast. These are the true stories of the harrowing journey to diagnosis. For the sake of privacy, participants in this program will appear with full or partial anonymity. One of the most enduring entertainment traditions in modern Japan is a distinct stylistic animation called anime. In recent decades, anime and the culture that surrounds it have become massively popular, not only throughout Asia, but around the world. Anime shows, films, and graphic novels called manga are found in all genres for all ages and often feature underdog protagonists fighting battles both literal and figurative on their quests to understand themselves. It's noteworthy that the subject of this episode of Undiagnosed should be so influenced by this storytelling style, seeing as the saga of her life reads not unlike an anime film. A talented young woman's dreams are smashed by illness and circumstance, yet she and her innate desire to provide for those she loves while making the world a friendlier, sillier, and more musical place creates a path of her own to unimaginable success. We don't know her real name. The truth is... You don't have to. Her 1.6 million followers on Twitch know her as a quirky, misunderstood gremlin with an O. She's a demon with a penchant for benevolent chaos, a bigger version of her own personality. As of 2023, she is the most subscribed to female creator on Twitch, and it's not uncommon for her colorful live streams to have tens of thousands of viewers at a time. Chat comments fly by in milliseconds. Recorded lines of her screaming Spanish swear words and proclamations like, I love you so much you have to die, randomly chime in over whatever game she's playing or conversation she's having. It's clear at any given moment that she and her viewers are both having the times of their lives. But not that long ago, she was stuck wondering if there was a life for her outside the walls of a hospital room. In her own words, she describes her darkest days as being a casual observer on a runaway train watching his life happen to her, rather than living it for herself. And all the while, yearning for a stage to use as an outlet. To her, the stories of her struggles and her triumphs are closely linked. It's no wonder why, considering that even her distinct, high-pitched voice is the result of a severe infection. Well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a trained opera singer, that's what I went to school for. Uh, I, I had a horrific throat infection. I lost my voice for a year and I could not speak. It was, I was unable to speak and essentially it, it's what killed me from singing. Basically it stopped me from singing. And, uh, I remember that was like one of the most depressive moments of my life. <clears throat> and, uh, I, I just never thought that I could sing again. And when my voice came back, uh, I also noticed that it was a little bit higher than it used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Uh, the doctor said it's probably because of damage or whatever. I I don't even know. It's just, I've always had a higher pitch voice. It just came back super higher when, when my voice came back. And I'm like, what the heck is this? I'm like, what is happening to me? This is the story of how a playful cartoon demon saved a real woman's life. This is the story of Iron Mouse. I, I wasn't diagnosed till much later, uh, but uh, I've always been... I like, to exp I like to explain it like I'm an extrovert who was forced to live an introverted lifestyle because um, I've always want. I was always a very curious child, and I was adventurous. But uh, out of all my siblings, I came out pretty sick, and um, I was always sick. And my parents were very, very, very protective of me. Uh, they were afraid any little step I take, I would get ill. And uh, so I was very sheltered growing up. 
um i remember i used to i i i would love to play outside and i would love to hang out with my family and my cousins and stuff and they were always going out and doing a lot of fun stuff but uh you know i had to get left behind a lot because i was always stuck at home uh when i was a kid my mom gave me a pep talk and she told me now mouse you need to understand that uh, I know that you're sick all the time. And this was like before I got diagnosed with CVID. She told me that I was born different and not everybody was born like me. And I have to work twice as hard to be normal, twice as hard to be as good as everybody else. And it happens to some people and to not feel bad about it. And I, I appreciate the conversation she had with me, but it's like, it kind of like put this mindset in me where it's like, I need to work twice as hard I need to work three times as hard and uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself and uh, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to things because of that fact. Being left behind in any capacity creates feelings that are difficult for a child to reconcile but when you add the complications of constant sickness from an unknown cause it can become impossible to have anything nearing a normal childhood. I've been seeing a lot of doctors since I was very young uh I, I would like to say, I, I don't think I bounced around a lot, but I saw a lot of specialists because it always just seemed like something was wrong with me. Uh, and my family were very concerned. So growing up, they kind of like thought that it was just like asthma and allergies with like something else, but they didn't know what the something else was. It's just, oh, well, maybe if we try this, she'll get better. Or maybe if we try that, she'll get better. And uh, nothing ever seemed to work. I had like really bad food allergies growing up, really bad allergies to ever. Everything was like allergies because I was always sick and I always had respiratory infections and I always had sinus infections and I would get constant ear infections. And it got to a point where I started missing so much school, where I was always in danger of getting kicked out of school, uh, getting in trouble. And uh, I always had to work extra hard. Uh, to get good grades because I missed so much school. And uh, I so I would make up for the fact that I was always not there with doing very well in school. And uh, I it was just a very overwhelming thing. Uh, I don't I would like to say that I didn't really have much of a childhood. I didn't get to enjoy all the things that uh, normal kids did. I did. I did enjoy some things. I'm not going to say that I didn't because there were there were a lot of things that I did get to do, but it was mostly inside. I didn't really, I wasn't allowed to play sports. I wasn't allowed to go to PE. I wasn't allowed to do anything that overexerted me, uh, anything that had to do with, you know, altering like my breathing or, you know, it was just, uh, it was a lot to take in as a kid. I remember feeling very upset growing up thinking that life was very unfair. Why did this have to happen to me? Why do I always have to be sick? And how come everybody just says that it's asthma and allergies, but my friends have asthma and allergies and they're fine and they can go out to the pool and do all this stuff. And I can't really do any of those things. Uh, so my parents were very adamant about refocusing my feelings. And I got into music and I got into performing, which was something that I could do. So, uh, I didn't really do much of like the normal kid stuff, but uh, because I I had a vocal lesson teacher and all this stuff, I was able to like get into like performing arts and sing and do some light dancing and stuff like that. So I was able to just hone all of the, uh, I don't want to say anger because I wasn't really angry. I was just, I just felt like life was very unfair and I was able to uh, hone all that and distract myself with performing. Artistic performance gave a young Iron Mouse her first taste of normalcy. At last, there was something she could excel at without a high risk of illness or injury. During her early teenage years, her constant sickness seemed to wane. After being denied a normal childhood, she was certain she was on track to at least experience a normal adulthood. I remember growing up thinking, oh, when I become an adult, I'm not going to be sick anymore and I'm going to be fine and I'm going to live my life and I'm going to... I'm going to be a singer because I want, I've always wanted to be an opera singer since I was like four. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be an opera singer and I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to do this and, and all that sick stuff because my doctors be like, you'll grow out of it. You'll grow out of it. It'll be fine. And I was like, well, you know, 
I'll, I'll, once I grow out of all this stuff, I'm going to be fine. And I'm going to do, I'm going to live my life. But then as I grew up, I was, I was really sick as a kid. And then when I, uh, when I got a little older, like I hit like puberty, uh, things got better a little bit. Uh, puberty kind of like helped me out a bit and I started not getting as sick as much and my doctors were like oh well she's getting better she's improving that's great and uh, I was happy but then <laughs> it's like I feel like everybody goes through this because I, I remember uh, when I first got diagnosed I was really scared and I, I was able to find like support groups and stuff thanks to the IDF and I was able to find other people like me thanks to the IDF and a lot of people's stories were very similar to mine where it's like they got better for a time, but then all of a sudden something happens and it just all goes bad again. So I was fine for like my first teenage years. And then all of a sudden I hit 18 and my body was just like, nope, that's it. Everything started going haywire again. And it was worse than when I was a child. And it was very overwhelming for me because I'm here trying to make it through school and I had to drop out of school because I just couldn't. Oh, God, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it because I just remember one time I had a teacher come up to me and my teacher was like, my teacher was like, Mouse, you were struggling in my class and you missed so much class. And I noticed that every time you come back to school, you're worse, you're sick, and it's hard for you to pay attention. And she was like, I suggest that you should drop out of school. And hearing that from a professor just affected me a lot because I felt like everybody was giving up on me. And I was working so hard to try to make it, to try to do something because I was the only one in my family that was like this. I was the only one in my family that didn't finish school. And I'm like, I have to finish school. I have to do this. I can't be the one that doesn't get things done. And uh, I just, I was very upset with my professor at the time, with my teacher at the time. And, you know, my teacher was like, I just really think that this is the best thing for you because do you not care about yourself? Do you not care about your life? Because if, you know, if you keep on working yourself this hard, it's, gonna go bad and uh I, I I remember for a time I was like nope I'm not gonna listen and I kept going to school and then I went through one of the worst bouts of illness that I've ever had where it knocked me out for like two three months and I was like okay maybe I should not go back to school <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. my teacher was right so it's just been like a constant struggle of uh trying to pretend to be normal and try to function like a normal person. This phenomenon is not isolated. Many PI patients of varying diagnoses experience a temporary improvement in adolescence. Unfortunately, at this time, any research on the topic is limited. Central to Mouse's story is her relationship with her parents. Mouse describes the presence of complicated grief in her home as she entered adulthood. As her infections grew more persistent, hospitalizations became longer. Unable to finish school or hold a job, she was entirely dependent on her parents, who were already at retirement age. The emotional toll her sickness had on her family motivated her even more to find answers. Uh, I remember some of my worst infections were right before I, I got diagnosed, and I, uh, I was going from doctor to doctor trying to figure out something. They kept telling me, oh, go to this hospital and go to this research hospital, see this. But unfortunately, you know, I live with my parents and um, because I couldn't hold a job, uh, my parents paid for everything and my parents are elderly. Uh, by the time this whole moment came around, they were already at retirement age and my parents had to unretire uh, to, they, they couldn't retire because they needed to support me. And it was very, it was a lot, um, uh, it was a lot, uh, for me because I care about my parents so much. They've been there for me. And uh, I just remember growing up thinking and, and waking up sometimes late at night and just seeing my mom cry because she doesn't understand what she did. My parents are very religious. They're very Catholic. So, to my mom, she feels like she did something wrong for me to come out this way. And uh, she just doesn't understand why. And I just remember 
seeing her in despair like all the time because she just wanted to do something to help and she couldn't and growing up I was taken to faith healers and all this stuff and uh <laughs> needless to say none of them worked <laughs> and uh finally uh I remember um we were we were struggling pretty bad and a lot of the medication that I was on was very expensive and um I was like okay well I need to find a solution and uh, I found my old immunologist. I saw an immunologist one time when I was younger and I don't know I, I don't know what exactly happened uh, that just it, it didn't like work out or something I don't honest I honestly don't remember I think it was because uh, our insurance changed and we couldn't afford to see them so I couldn't see them anymore and uh, nothing ever got done so I found them and they're still practicing and it turns out that the insurance that we were on this time actually works with them so I was like oh well why don't we just go see this person they're still practicing and they were like wow you're you're all grown up now but uh you're 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 back here and I was like I explained to them everything that happened and I said you know I got I improved and stuff but uh, I turned 18 and everything just went to hell again so uh, I don't really know what to do anymore. And, uh, you know, they looked over my history and they said, these are a lot of infections back to back. And uh, these are a lot of hospitalizations. And they were like, I think I want to get you tested to see if maybe you have a, a primary immune deficiency disease. Because at first they thought, so the first thing I got tested for was cystic fibrosis, which came back negative. Everybody thought that that's what I had because the the respiratory infections I kept having was just insane. It was just like really bad. Um, and then uh, my immunologist said, okay, well, we're going to test for, I think we also tested for uh, alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin or something. Yeah, alpha-1. And uh, that came back negative. And uh, they're like, we're going to test for, for primary immune deficiency disease. And I got the pneumovax vaccine. And well... <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you had no, no um, response. No response. Okay. Yeah. At all. <laughs> it was, it was like, and it's, it's so funny because uh, I had just gotten over a very huge illness. I just had a surgery. I had sinus surgery done and uh, I was really ill and my family was on vacation. And I remember I got a call from my doctor and my doctor was like, well, we really need you to come in. And I'm like, okay <laughs> so I went in and they're like I know what's wrong with you and I'm like I felt relief but I also felt fear at the same time because I'm like holy shit. oh I'm so sorry I didn't mean to curse I'm so sorry this is the moment that I've been waiting for I finally have a answer as to all these years as to why they were like we know what's wrong with you uh you have CVID and I'm like what is that <laughs> And I remember my mom was crying because the first thing she asked is like, is she going to die? And I'm, and the doctor's like, the doctor's like, well, if she takes care of herself, she'll be fine. And I was just like, okay, I, but that's when all these questions started appearing. And I'm like, what is this? I've never heard of this before in my life. Like, I didn't know what it was. I've never heard of it. I didn't even know about PID. I didn't know any of this stuff. All I knew the only thing, the only reference I had was uh, uh, Bubble Boy uh, story, um, and uh, that 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 was basically it. And I know that that that's SCID, and I'm just like, I'm like, so what? What is this? You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. And the doctor sat down with me and explained to me everything, and I felt like I didn't listen to a word because I heard common variable immune deficiency disease it was like all of a sudden my brain like what my soul went somewhere else they were like do you understand that you have to go on treatment and I'm like uh, yeah okay I remember the day that I came home from my diagnosis uh, I just started googling like crazy I was googling everywhere I was I was frantically googling and <laughs> I couldn't find anything and I'm like Jesus, I don't even know how to look. Like, I just found, like, the most vague stuff. And I found the IDF. 
and uh, I was able to get in touch with people. And I remember I was so terrified. I was so scared, but it was so, it was a bittersweet relief to me because Mm -hmm. I found people that were like me and I found people that understood what I was going through, but it made me sad because it's like the fact that other people are going through this too, just tears me apart and it really makes me very sad and it was a lot to take in. (laughs) As anyone with PI can tell you, a diagnosis may provide relief and clarity, but it's hardly the end of the journey. Mouse's immunoglobulin levels were so low that her doctor insisted she start IVIG treatment the next day. Her first infusion was disastrous. The facility that cared for her wasn't necessarily equipped or fully trained on the administration of IG replacement. She didn't receive pre-meds, and the medication was applied far too fast, causing an extreme reaction. Eventually, as her body became accustomed to the infusions, she experienced both improvements and setbacks. This caused her doctors to tweak her infusion dosage and schedule, providing her with relief for the first time in her life. However helpful, medicine is expensive, particularly when derived from biological substances such as plasma. At times, Mouse and her family found themselves unable to afford treatment. Mouse's infections and hospitalizations continued, eventually leading to severe lung damage. She considers the severity of her CVID as, at least in part, a byproduct of financial instability. Not to mention the difficulty of convincing insurance companies to pay for proper treatment. All of these factors eventually led to Mouse becoming convinced that she'd never truly get to experience life. I did go through a time where I couldn't really like, uh, we had a lot of financial issues at home. And uh, it was pretty scary for a minute because I had to miss a lot of treatments. That was another issue that I had. Uh, I missed a lot of treatments because, you know, simply we couldn't afford it. We were having issues with insurance. Um, Also, the fact of my age, I was so young. And uh, uh, the insurance company was like, well, she's so young and she does. We don't think she needs this. This this is very strange and this is very expensive. And I had to jump through so many hoops to try to get things to happen. And sometimes it just didn't work out. So there was moments where I just couldn't get my IVID and I would get worse. So I think that uh, the fact that I couldn't get adequate medical care and adequate uh, medical resources to me because of financial issues. uh, And uh, I I feel like that played a lot in my severity because I know it's not it's different for everybody. Uh, My health declined in such a way where it's like I was so severe. I I became so severe. I couldn't be around people. Uh, Any type of contact with like my family or with friends or I, I would get sick like so quickly. Like it got to the point where I couldn't leave my house. I was always on medicine. I was always on anti IV antibiotics to the point because uh my I couldn't take oral anymore because orals just did nothing to me. I started having malabsorption issues and a host of other issues that I would never even dream of having. I caught shingles. I had shingles and it's like at my age, shingles, so many strange things happened back to back where it's like, I just ended up having to get so isolated. I was put on oxygen. Uh, I had to get, uh, uh, you know, percussive therapy for my chest. And I had a nurse coming over all the time. I had to be on IV antibiotics and antivirals and all this stuff. And not to mention all the stomach issues that you get and having my gut torn to shreds. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. <laughs> A lot of issues and a lot of specialists that I had to see. And it was just so exhausting uh, that I couldn't go to school. I didn't have, I lost, I, I don't want to say I lost my friends because it was just like, it, it was just hard to maintain friendships. And it got to the point where I started getting so sick, I could barely get out of bed. I was bedridden for so long. My uh, respiratory issues and all these other issues that I was going through, it just, completely destroyed me and I think like some of my longest hospitalizations were like months at a time and you know you 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 stay immobile for so long you start having atrophy and you're on so much steroids they put me on so much steroids I developed chronic pain and it just affected my uh mental a lot (laughs) I remember one time I was in the hospital and I was with my sister and You know, I was telling her how sad I was because I was like, man, I just, 
I just really wish that I just could have done what I wanted to do in life. And I just really wanted to sing. And she's like, she's like, you never know what might happen for you. And I'm like, and I'm like, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Cause at the time I was going through a really bad infection and it did not look good that, that particular time. Um, and um, uh, my sister was like, Oh, you know, it could, it could still happen. You just need to have faith. And I'm just like, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't even think I'm going to make it out of here. And she was like, you can't talk like that. You, you can't, because if you start surrounding yourself with that type of energy, it's just not going to motivate you to, you know, she was very positive, you know, and, Sometimes that's the last thing you want to hear. But I'm grateful that she told me that because then she was like, well, why don't you tell me if you were to get one wish granted, what would it be? And I was like, I would love to be a singer. And then she was like, what kind of singer would you like to be? And I'm like, and I told her, I was like, I think if I ever do singing, I just, I just want to be like, I just want to be a faceless singer I don't want people to know who I am because at the time I was getting into I was getting into something called utaite uh basically there's like a genre of music where it's like you're you have a persona and you never show your face but you perform music and you upload it online so I was like I would love to do that and she was like well you never know you might be able to do that Mouse's condition was so severe that she was almost entirely homebound bedridden and isolated while her aging parents continued to work to provide for her. She grew to resent her condition so strongly that she found herself making a conscious effort to avoid any conversation about CVID or even acknowledge its existence. Her desire for escape was agonizing, but it led her to consider a unique hobby on a corner of the internet that was only starting to grow in popularity. I was trapped at home for a long time and I remember I would go online and I would play games and stuff or I would like watch stuff and I started watching streamers. I started watching people stream uh, because that kind of became like the thing to watch. You know, TV is kind of dying off. And uh, I stopped watching TV um, and I started watching streamers and I started seeing how much fun they were having, playing games and talking. And I'm like, man, I wish I could do that. I really, I really wish I could do that. And I remember talking to my friend and my friend was like, well, why don't you do it? And I'm like, maybe, maybe I could maybe, you know, see if I can make friends. Cause I was just, I just remember even, even being in a support group and talking to people with CVID and stuff. I don't know. I just felt so alone, even knowing that there were people like me, uh, mm -hmm. but because we were all like of different like severities, right. Still like something in me that I felt, I just felt isolated. It was, it was a lot. And I just thought, you know, maybe if I go online and maybe I could stream and like, I can make friends and talk to people and, you know, I, cause I, I also wanted to talk to people that didn't have CBID and that didn't have what I had. And there was a part of me that just wanted to just be normal and talk about normal stuff and not think about it. I went through a moment where it's just like, I don't even want to think about CBID. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to acknowledge the fact that I have it. I just want to forget that all of this stuff is happening. I was scared to start because I didn't want to, I have a little bit of a complex regarding being sick because, uh, you know, I'm connected to machines and I'm on oxygen and I just felt scared. I didn't want people to see me like that. I didn't want people to feel bad about me. I just didn't want that to be a focus of, of why I was streaming and why I was online. So I didn't want to, I just didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want anybody to, to, to ask me questions so uh, I kind of like pretended like I was not sick for uh, quite some time. Uh, I remember my friend was like, well, if you're afraid to start streaming, why don't you? There's this program that you can use uh, and you can be an anime character. And I remember seeing this anime girl. Her name is Kizuna Ai. Uh, she was this, she was something called a VTuber. And I thought that was like a term just for her. I, so VTuber is a virtual uh, YouTuber. So she would, it was a woman that she would be uh, an anime girl. And that was her persona. She was a character named Kizuna Ai. She would go on YouTube, make videos and do like, uh, do like, you know, gameplay and like talking to people. And I just thought that that was the cutest thing. And I thought it was so adorable. And I was like, man, I wish I could do that. But it seems like it would be so expensive to do. Uh, I don't think I could ever do that because it seems like it's like it was a 3D. It was a 3D rig. It was a 3D model. So I figured she's probably like 
jumping around and it's motion capture software and stuff. And I can't even get out of bed. So I can't do that. And then my friend, a friend of mine was like, you know, there's a program that you could use called a uh, face rig where you can be an anime girl too. And you don't have to like be in a 3d model. It's 2d and it just tracks the movement of your camera. And I was like, Oh, okay. I guess I could do that. So I, uh, my friend got it for me as a gift and, uh, it's been the one of the greatest gifts anyone could ever give me because that's what sparked my uh, career and what sparked my love of streaming. And um, so I became this anime girl. I wasn't Iron Mouse yet. I was just random anime girl. I mean, I was Iron Mouse, but I was just like, uh, I wasn't myself. My character wasn't really fully realized. Uh, I was using like free models because I didn't have money and you know, uh, my parents would, I, I thought my parents would never like pay, help pay for any of this stuff. We can barely support ourselves with my medical bills. And they were piling up like so, so much. Also, <laughs> I was still very ill when I first started. So I took a lot of breaks. Like I was not as consistent as I was now. I could only stream when I first started streaming. I could only stream for like one hour at a time because I was so sick and so exhausted. It, it it was just, I, it was hard to lift my head off the pillow. So when I first started streaming, I was laying down in bed streaming. I had my laptop on my, on my lap and I was using earbuds, like the Apple earbuds to talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. I was using that as my microphone to speak. And I was using a crappy webcam that was in a really bad laptop. Horrible. It was so hot. I ended up getting a lap desk because it would overheat from me like streaming for like one hour. And I remember thinking, man, this, this is, it was like one of the happiest moments of my life starting streaming because even though I was doing it from like this horrible setup it from my bed, at least it, I felt like I was finally taking control of my life. Yeah. Today. Mouse sees herself as a fierce advocate for people with illnesses like hers and uses her platform to spread awareness of PI and the need for plasma donation. She makes a pointed effort to empower her community while avoiding false positivity and overt negativity. But at first, she was more than a little apprehensive to share that she was suffering behind the camera. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about it at all. I just... I just didn't want to be seen as the sick girl on online. You know, I wanted to be Iron Mouse. I wanted people to like me for me and not think about any of that stuff. I just, I just surrounded myself in fantasy for a long time because I just didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with any of that stuff. I felt like I've had too many, too many years dealing with a bunch of depressed stuff and I just didn't want to deal with it. It was it was a lot for me. And I know running away from your problems is not good, but it worked for me for a time. So, you know, uh, I think for my sanity, I really needed the break. Uh, but um, it unfortunately, I wish I could say I had an empowering moment uh, as to why I shared it, but it wasn't really empowering. It was more like um, I started getting sick again uh, because I... I you know, it's a cycle with me. Uh, I, I think also I used to stream. I started streaming a little bit more. So my body was like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? And then uh, it was a it was a time where I was having insurance issues and stuff. So I wasn't getting the meds that I needed at the time. And I still hadn't like started earning like a comfortable uh living you know so like at first it was like a struggle I didn't make any money at first and it, it took a while for me to make uh consistent money uh through streaming so it, it was it was tough but um the reason why I talked about it was because it was getting very hard to hide <laughs> it was getting extremely hard to explain why uh, I would go away for so long why I could only stream for x amount of time uh, and then my IV machine started beeping and people could hear it. And I didn't have a proper microphone set up with a noise gate to like block out all excess noise around me. So people would hear my oxygen machine. Like, it sounds like there's an airplane in your house. What is that? And I'm like, oh, my God, I was so embarrassed. And I, I would like make stuff up 
And then it got to the point where one day I was just like, I just need to stop making stuff up because this is just, I just need to say it. And uh, I, after me having multiple panic attacks and worrying about people being like put off or like finding it weird, I finally talked about it and I explained my situation and I explained my health issues and it was the most support that I've ever seen. Like I was so overwhelmed with the amount of support uh, from people that were watching me. I was so shocked because I was for sure certain that people would, I don't know. I always think the worst, <laughs> but I think it's like, I, I think it's just like through my experience, I always expect the worst at all times. And I know I shouldn't be this way, but it's hard not to be this way. I always had this thing in me where it's like, I'm going to tell people and they're just, it's just going to be bad. It's going to go bad. And uh, thankfully it did not. And people were very supportive. And uh, I slowly started talking about it more and more. And I shared that, you know, I have a uh, IV machine and I named my equipment and my IV machine's name is Rutherford. And I have my air concentrator, I have my concentrator and I have all this stuff. And I just started, you know, talking about it. And it was interesting because then I slowly started getting people who also had health issues watch me. And uh, I started getting so many kind messages from people saying that, you know, how empowering it was to hear my story and to see me doing all these things and that it gave them hope. Like, for the most part, I think I'm more of an optimist myself, but given my circumstances, it has led me to become <laughs> pessimistic but only when it comes to like my own stuff, not when it comes to like other things. It's weird. I'm very critical of myself. I'm very hard on myself. Uh, I always expect the worst and I know I shouldn't and I'm trying to fix it. It's, it's just, it's difficult. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to break, but it's only because of all the stuff that I've been through that I am the way I am. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it, but I try not to let that, uh, I try not to let that seep into like my streams or like any of like my content and stuff because I just I just really want I don't know I just want I just want to make people smile and I want to make people laugh. Mouse's modest growth in the early part of her career was hardly enough to become financially stable. Her parents continued to work, unsure of what she was even doing, of who she was talking to in her room at all hours of the day and night. Then came spring of 2020. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the great wave of job loss hit Mouse's family particularly hard. In a bizarre twist of fate, it was her online character, that foul-mouthed animated demon, who saved the day. I, ha I was living with extreme guilt for a long time because I was so ill that they were still taking care of me. And it's like, I, I, I felt so guilty that I had nothing to contribute to the house and I had nothing. I, they were, they were just, it, it just really ate at me. And then the whole streaming thing happened and then COVID hit and I felt even more guilty because they lost their jobs, even though they were supposed to be retired, but they lost their jobs. And I remember the first week that was when Iron Mouse, like the, the day they got fired was the day that I, not fired, the day they lost their employment was the day that I essentially like blew up on Twitch because a friend of mine raided me and I went from having like 100 viewers to like 800 viewers and then 1,000 viewers. And I'm like, what is happening? And then a lot of people started watching me and, and I started actually earning money from streaming. And it was just the the overwhelming emotion I had when I, I, I heard my parents worried because they're like, how are we going to pay bills? Like, we're going to get kicked out of this house. What are we going to do? Da, 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 da. And I could finally call my mom to come to my room and tell her, mom, you don't have to worry. I have money. And then she, and she was like, where did you get it from? And I was like, I, you know, you know, my little, my little, sh she calls it my little show. I'm like, you know, my little show on, on, on the internet. And she's like, oh yeah, the little show you do with your friends. And I'm like, well, I, I make money now and I, 
and it was just like a an emotional moment because I was able to finally, for the first time in my life, I paid every single bill that my parents had. I paid off my mom's house. I I uh, got caught up on medical bills, uh, and now I take care of my parents financially, and they don't have to worry. And I remember feeling so bad because not only did they lose their jobs, but because of me, they had to isolate completely because of the fear of COVID. And it was like the doctors told them immediately. They were like, you cannot go anywhere because if your daughter gets COVID, she is going to die. And the fact that they had to stop going to church, which is something that they love. They had to stop uh, ha hanging out with their friends, which is something that they loved. They had to stop hanging out with family, which is something that they loved. It, and then I, you know, they were just at home, locked up with me for two years, basically. And it, it, it left me with such guilt that I was just like, I'm going to do everything in my power to give my parents the best years of their life now because I just feel like I owe it to them after everything that they've done for me. And um, thankfully, I was able to uh, afford getting a new place. And I remember my sister was like, what kind of place are you looking for? And I was like, I want a spacious house where there is enough space for me to be in my own area and then my family can be in their own area. And if they want to have friends over, they can and they don't have to worry about me getting sick because the house is big enough for them to have fun and have friends over and have family over and do whatever they want to do. And we found it and now we're here. And my family, man, <laughs> my mom and my dad, they're so happy. And it's, it's like night and day. I just feel like we were all like, going through the motions of life in our old place and it was just a very sad vibe over there now over here it's like I my mom for the first time I I saw her sitting on a couch watching a movie I have never seen my mom do that in my life because my mom is from the mindset where it's like my life is to work for my children and to take care of my children and to make sure that they that my daughter is, stays alive and that she's fine and that's been, my parents have been working nonstop for years and they did not believe in downtime. They did not believe in any sort of like a, a entertainment or anything. And to see my parents just enjoying each other on a couch and seeing my parents like eat a proper meal at the dinner table because I could actually afford to buy good groceries. It's just, it, it was, it's just so heartwarming and I'm just really happy and, and very thankful and, and I feel very blessed and you know I'm, I'm just very thankful that I'm able to do this for them and I want to continue to be able to do this for them uh, until I until the day that I'm gone which hopefully isn't anytime soon <laughs> Despite her parents' support, Mouse still has an understandably difficult time explaining her career to them. Her mother in particular expressed concern over her character's background, which is explored in greater detail in an upcoming anime special. But yeah, so I had to explain to my mom, because my mom, when I explained to my mom about VTubing, I had to tell her, I'm like, so I'm a VTuber, she goes, okay. And then I showed her my character, she's like, what are those things on your head? Are those horns? And I'm like... Yeah, because I'm a demon. She's like, what? You're a demon. I'm like, well, I'm my backstory is that I'm Satan uh, and I'm on Earth disguised as like a girl named Iron Mouse. But it's not because I'm doing anything bad. It's because I escaped from hell because I don't want to live there anymore. I saw the human world and I thought humans were amazing and they're incredible and they do so many fun things and hell is so boring. Uh, that's that's my backstory. But I know it's a lot because you say Satan and people are like, ew, what? You know, but they're like, oh, God, especially my parents. They're, they're super Catholic. And my mom was like, is there any chance that you don't have to be Satan? And I'm like, I'm sorry, mom. That's already my lore. It's already locked in. I can't change it. And she goes, well, it's fine. As as long as you don't like make fun of like God and stuff, it's fine. I'm like, I would never. But, uh, you know, it's 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 just a fun little thing. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. She also loves the fact that Iron Mouse, since Iron Mouse was Satan and is a demon, that means Iron Mouse also has an angel form. And she's like, can't you just stay as an angel all the time? And I'm like, 
No, <laughs> I can't, but. People with PI know the importance of a support system, both in and outside of the family. Iron Mouse seems to go out of her way as often as possible to express how much her friends and co-workers mean to her. She's now a member of a massively popular VTuber company called Vshojo. She jokes that her frequent collaborator and friend of IDF, Connor Cahoon, uses her real full name to chastise her when she's in trouble for not getting enough rest. The pair have developed a dynamic, both on and off screen, that has led to one of the internet's favorite friendships. I used to watch his videos. <laughs> so I was like a, I, I'm not going to say I was a fan because I, I, I would watch his videos and then I found out uh, I was I found out that he talked about me on his podcast and I'm like I'm like what the heck he talked about me and he said he admitted to watching me and my streams and I'm like oh that's funny and then after that he like he messaged me he DM'd me on Twitter he was like I really like your content I think you're really cool and I was like okay and we I invited him on a show that I did with my with my friends from Vishojo. And then I ghosted him because <laughs> and then after after he went on the show, I I kind of like got nervous talking to him because I was still in a mind frame where I was like, I can't get close to anybody. This is this is too much. I I, I was in a I was in a moment where I was afraid to get close to anybody. I didn't want to get close to anybody. Uh, so I didn't talk to him for a few months. And then that was like in November. And then in January, he messages me and he's like, oh, do you want to be in one of my videos? And I'm like, OK. And then that day when we were recording for the video, we talked for like five hours and we've been like best friends like ever since. And one day he, he, he told me, he was like, man, it would be really cool if you could like meet up with me uh, in Japan. Like you would love Japan. Part of me was like, I felt so comfortable around him and I wasn't afraid to be myself. So I was like, I'm just going to tell him the truth. I don't think I was scared. I was really scared. So scared to tell him. But part of me thought, you know what, if I tell him the truth and he doesn't want to talk to me anymore, he thinks I'm weird, that's fine. It's okay. I'm not going to hate him or anything. It's fine. So I was like, I can't go to Japan because I have a condition. And then he was like, what condition do you have? And then I told him everything. I, and I've never done that before. I just straight up told him I was honest from, from the beginning. And I was like, I have, I have CBID and I explained to him all this stuff. He's like, I have never heard about this before. And he cried. <laughs> he cried for me. I remember the first time, the first cyclothon, uh, we were talking and he was telling me he wanted to do a cyclothon. And I was like, oh my God, why? And he's like, cause I want to raise money for charity. And I'm like, well, how, well, how long are you going to do it for his? And he told me, oh, a few days and whatever. And I, I didn't want to like ask him. Because I, I, I figured it was some cause there or whatever. And I was like, okay, so what what charity are you going to do it for? He goes, oh, I'm doing it for the IDF. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, why? And he's like, what do you mean, why? Are you not happy? And I'm like, I am happy, but I just want to know. What, what brought this on? And he's like, he's like, I just, he's like, I just want, <laughs> I just want to have a beer with you one day. <laughs> Mouse has a lot going on, and she admits to being a bit of a workaholic. She streams more days than not, but despite this, she's recently regained enough mobility to enjoy her new home, and is in the process of discussing long-term improvements with her doctors. While she assures us that she's taking care of herself amid a hectic work schedule, Mouse admitted to us that she's never really filled her care team in on what she does for a living, and only partially because it's hard to explain. I kind of, my doctors kind of don't know about Iron Mouse. <laughs> yeah, that's another reason why I'm afraid to say stuff because my voice is very recognizable, uh, one. And two, because this is this is my voice. This is very recognizable. And two, they don't know that I do this whole, I've never told, the only person that knows about Iron Mouse is my nurse and it's because she comes to my house and she has caught me uh streaming and she's caught me and she's seen my setup and she's like what is all this it looks like a space station because i have like the the multiple monitors i have like all my equipment and stuff now and she's like this looks like a space station what is this and then she saw my character and she's like what's this little what's this little 
whole character thing. And I'm like, I just told her. And she was like, oh my God, that's so cool. And she fully supports me, but she's like, you need to take care of yourself. You better not overwork yourself because if not, I'm going to tell your doctor. I'm like, no, please don't tell them. Jesus. Uh, sometimes I admit I'm bad. You know, I overwork myself and I push myself and, you know, I know my limits and I try to make sure not to go beyond my limits because I know that uh, if I do, then I can't stream. So. <laughs> when asked if she would do anything differently, given the chance to start over, Mouse's answer is simple. I wish I could have been diagnosed sooner. That's for sure. I feel like the only reason why I got so severe was because it took so long for me to get diagnosed and it was a struggle because of our financial situation. So it's the only reason why I got as severe as I did, which was pretty bad. Uh, a lot of people that I meet with CVID that I've met online, it's so varied because there's some people that they, that for the most part, they're living a pretty normal life. Uh, but I got to a point where I just had to like completely isolate myself. And I was just so sick that I was just confined to my, to my bed for a few years. And it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot for me. Uh, it was very emotionally taxing, very spiritually taxing. Um, but thankfully, uh, you know, that time is over and I'm slowly regaining mobility and slowly, you know, learning how to learning how to live my life again. And uh, I'm able to spend a little bit of time with family now, even though it's still it's it's tough still. But uh I, I just wish I would have gotten diagnosed sooner. I, I really do. Uh, sometimes I do wish I would have streamed sooner too. Uh, I think I was really scared to start, you know, but um, everything happens for a reason. And I'm just glad that it happened the way it did. And I do have that piece of me that wishes some stuff, but for the most part, I don't. I think everything happened the way it should happen. And I'm happy that it did. It's funny because like I... So, <laughs> I've talked to Connor about this or I'm like, man, I wish I wasn't sick. And I wish that I was normally like, yeah, but if you weren't sick, you would be an opera singer and I wouldn't know you. And I'm like, that's true. <laughs> but um, at first, I remember I used to regret the day that I talked about having CVID on stream because uh, I received bullying from certain individuals. I, I did get bullied a little bit. And, you know, there'll be the, the, the usual comments on YouTube or the usual comments on on Reddit or somewhere saying, oh, well, she's only popular because she's sick and people pity her and blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, uh, I remember thinking, man, I regret talking about this stuff because people always use that to hurt me. Like some, you know, bully. People who want to bully you, they'll use whatever it, they can. And, you know, but I'm so thankful that I did share my story. And I'm so thankful that I did open up about it because, the amount of good that's come from it outweighs any type of bullying that I've ever received. And, um, you know, uh, anybody who says n nasty stuff about me or say that people pity me, well, they don't watch me and they don't care about my content anyway. So I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about their opinion. I think the, the nicest thing for me, the thing that, <laughs> the thing that touches me the most is having people, uh, I recently did a, convention uh and i did a meet and greet at a convention and to have uh, other people come to me and say that i inspired them to just get out of you know try to get out of bed and to not be afraid and inspire them and, and help them feel like just because they're sick that that's not the end and they can do things and it was just, it was just a lot. It's a lot. And it, and it means so much to me to have people be inspired and uh, meet so many VTubers that are, that have illnesses and that have disabilities and that they found a new purpose in their life through VTubing because of me. And it's just, it, it's just, it, it's, in, it's so surreal and it's, 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 it's wonderful and it touches my heart so much. And I didn't expect to have this sort of impact on people it just warms my heart that there's so many people out there that they can do anything with their lives. They can do anything. Like people's time is so valuable. You know, that's, that's the most important thing that we have on earth. It's time. And the fact that they are using that time to spend time with me and to watch me, it's just, it, it, I'm, 
I'm just incredibly grateful and I it, it's 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 a lot it's a lot because it's like you could be doing anything and you're here watching me and it just it's 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 uh I just feel very very lucky I feel very lucky I have to I deal with imposter syndrome all the time and uh I deal with a lot of other things you know uh I still have a lot of fears in me where it's like even though all this amazing stuff is happening uh I always have this fear in the back of my mind where it's like, well, how long is it until it's all taken away from me because CBID wants to be mean to me again, you know? So I, I, I have, I have a lot of worries and fears, but I try not to think about it. I try to think about all the positive things that have been happening. And I try to think about what I want to do. And I remember when I first started growing, uh, when I first started growing on Twitch and, you know, uh, this became like a career for me. And I became comfortable with talking about CVAD. I remember the first thing in my brain I I thought of was I remember being diagnosed and being afraid because I didn't know anybody who had this problem. And no one talks about it. I feel like no one talks about it in mainstream culture. No one talks about it out loud. It's it's still very like small because the community is small. And I remember thinking if I could just if I could just talk about it and reach at least one person and, and convince one person to donate plasma, it'll be a good day. Streamers are typically very protective of their audiences. In a niche entertainment industry that exploded during the global isolation of the COVID pandemic, creators tend to recognize that their regular viewers speak a language that's unique to them as a community. They use custom emotes specific to the channel. Iron Mouse, for instance, has a plasma bag emote as well as a Puerto Rican flag. It seems only natural that they'd be apprehensive to share their most precious commodity, their community, with a different, unfamiliar, and separate community. But in the case of introducing her audience to IDF, Mouse seemed to think it was only natural. To me, it's like, man, I think about it this way. CVID has like taken everything from me, but I've been able to acquire my life back also because of CVID. So... To me, it's like, it's such a big part of my life now, and I'm not afraid to talk about it now, uh, that I just, I just want people to know. I want people to know about it. I want people to understand it. I just don't want, I, I, I just think about how scared I was when I was diagnosed. And it's like I said, if I could stop that from happening and somebody is not so scared, I, I think I did a good job and if I could get one more person to donate plasma, I think I, I, I will be content with everything that I've done because I just remember, I remember going through a few plasma shortages and it was really scary because I couldn't get the plasma that I needed. And I'm like, man, if only more people would donate plasma and now, and then it got even more scary because of COVID happening. And I was just like, Jesus it's it's terrifying because like if no one donates plasma then what's gonna happen to us so i was like i need to i need to just see if i can get more people to donate plasma and uh thankfully everybody's been so receptive and my community uh, so many people from my community donate it's insane it's crazy i get so many pictures from people donating and people are like oh yeah i donate every other like every other week or I, I regularly donate now and it's just like I'm content <laughs> I'm happy and I don't mind sharing I, I I think it's it's important uh for people to know that uh you know this is a problem and we don't have to go through it alone and suffer in silence anymore as much as I love being entertaining and I love being a little shit on the internet and I love, you know, telling jokes and being a gremlin and the most part for me, my number one thing is educating and teaching people about CVID and about PID and about donating plasma and uh, making sure that if there is another iron mouse out there and she's going through something like me and she's scared and she doesn't know what the heck is going on, she can know that there's other people out there that went through it and um there is there is light at the end of the tunnel even though it seems like there isn't oh god <laughs> and so after having the stage stolen away from her 
in such a cruel way, in such a way that led to so many years of loneliness and hardship. Iron Mouse has managed to build a stage of her own, from which, at the top of her lungs, she can finally sing. Your support of IDF helps to ensure that people like Iron Mouse get the advocacy, education, and community support they deserve. To donate, volunteer, or learn more about primary immunodeficiency, visit primaryimmune.org.